What a thrilling life awaits you. The acquisition of knowledge is a sacred activity. A truly educated man never ceases to learn. The future is in your hands. The outcome is up to you. This BYU devotional address with Aaron Mond was given on August 4th, 2009. Aaron Mann is an assistant professor of nursing in the College of Nursing and a certified clinical nurse specialist in community health nursing. Professor Mann was born and raised in New Hampshire and is the second of nine children. After returning from a full-time mission to San Juan, Puerto Rico, she earned a master's degree in community health nursing and a PhD in nursing with an emphasis in school nursing and health policy in 2006, both from the University of Utah. Dr. Mon has worked as a registered nurse, as a school nurse, as a state school nurse consultant for the Utah Department of Health. She joined BYU's faculty in 2003. Professor Mon enjoys traveling, reading, and cheering for the Boston Red Sox. She currently serves as her ward's primary president and as a Provo Temple worker. And now we'll hear from Sister Erin Mon. I just wanted to say thank you for that music. That was absolutely beautiful. And I pray that I will say what the Lord would like me to say. When Lonnie, who just gave the prayer, was about eight years old, the two of us were spending some time together. At the time, I had been home for my mission less than a year and still kind of in that missionary mode in some ways. That day, I felt the need to help young Lonnie gain a greater love and understanding of the scriptures. So I began to tell her how answers to any problem or concern she may have could be found in the scriptures. I really thought I was doing a fantastic job with my little impromptu lesson, so I ended it enthusiastically, asking if her if she had anything troubling her at the time. Remember, she's eight. So I could show her how the process worked using the scriptures. She thought for a moment and then said with a bit shyly, well, I am having trouble in math. <laughs> math. <laughs> I was caught off guard. That was not what I was expecting as an answer. <laughs> but after thinking a little bit, I found a story in the scriptures that had to do with the numbers, and off we went. The scriptures really do have the answers to all questions or concerns, even math. One verse in particular has helped me numerous times in my life. It is found in the 101st section of the Doctrine and Covenants, where the Lord is actually chastising the people, but then in verse 16 says, Therefore, let your hearts be comforted concerning Zion. For all flesh is in my hands. Be still and know that I am God. I absolutely love this scripture, particularly the last part, be still and know that I am God. Today I would like to talk about how being still helps us gain a better understanding of life events, why things happen, or why they don't happen, and then how that helps us know and understand God. Situations can be hard because we want to know and understand. Our way was great. Why didn't it happen that way? Or why do bad things happen to good people? Maybe you didn't get into the major you wanted. Maybe class isn't turning out how you thought. Maybe a family member is sick. There are lots of disappointments in the world that may be hard to understand. Instead of stressing over them or blaming others, sometimes it is best to be still and become humble and put your trust in God that all is well. Now those of you who know me, I'm sure, are probably laughing a bit about this because I am certainly not the poster child of a stress-free attitude. <laughs> this is actually something I've struggled with my entire life. I actually used to think I strived on stress. I thought it best if I worked best under stress, so I actually would pile it on, thinking I'd do everything that much better. In addition, my personality is such that I probably worry and stress about just about everything. The stress and worry literally caused me to become physically sick. About a year ago, I was talking to a friend who turned to me and simply said, to worry is to lack faith. This struck me pretty hard. Think about it, it really does make sense. If we worry and try and put it all on our own shoulders, we are not trusting the Lord is in control or that he understands the situation. I cannot tell you the number of times this counsel has helped me and calms me when I didn't understand why events occurred in, and in that process, I think, or at least hope, that I have grown. This past spring, I was with a group of nursing students in the United Kingdom on a study abroad where we were, we were learning about the healthcare system. It was a wonderful trip and like past study abroad programs I have participated in, did not expect everything to go as planned. However, this trip seemed to bring on more challenges than normal. Now in nursing, classes are a bit different because we have our required classroom time, 
but we are also required a number of clinical hours that students must spend in a clinical setting, such as a hospital, or for me as a public health nurse in the community, such as in a school or the public health department. In England, we had partnered with a university who had arranged for us to be in the local hospital. After only about one and a half weeks into our clinical rotation, I was told that due to some changes in visa rules and how they had been interpreted, we immediately had to stop going to the hospital. The news was shocking. We still had numerous hours we needed to complete in order to comply with our clinical hour requirement. More importantly, our main purpose in coming to England was to be involved in the healthcare system. What were we going to do now? Well, we scrambled and prayed hard and were able to arrange alternative experiences for the students in other parts of the healthcare system besides that one hospital. In the end, the students even acknowledged that the unexpected change in events had actually been a blessing in disguise because we were able to see a much broader view of the healthcare system and were exposed to so much more. A change that seemed devastating at first became a blessing because we changed our perspective. I'm very grateful for the students and their positive attitude during this trip. Numerous things didn't work out as they had been planned. It got to the point that we would literally just laugh when the next scheduled event did not work out. In many ways, be still and know that I am God literally became our motto. Along with some wise counsel, a friend of one of the students shared, it isn't what happens in life that matters, but only how we react to it. Elder Worthland further counseled us, the way we react to adversity can be a major factor in how happy and successful we can be. The simple secret is this, put your trust in the Lord, do your best, and leave the rest up to him. If we learn to be humble, look at things with a more eternal perspective, and put our trust in the Lord, all will be well. Realize that often the experiences we may have are really to help us. This does not mean we should just sit back and do nothing. Agency and personal choices definitely impact our outcomes, but we just have to, and we have to do our part. But we must remember to give up some of the control and put our trust in God. Let me share a brief example from my own life with this. It occurred when I had received my mission call. I actually was 21 when I graduated from the nursing program, although I turned 22 not soon after, and so I left on my pit mission after I had graduated. I'm a bit embarrassed now to admit, but one of the reasons I went into nursing was because I really wanted to serve a welfare and humanitarian mission, and I thought nursing would increase my chances. And it seemed my plan had worked. My original call was to be a mission nurse in Venezuela. However, while in the MTC, we had difficulty obtaining visas to enter Venezuela. Some missionaries had been in the MTC an extra two months just waiting for their visas. Finally, it was decided that our calls would be changed. Within a day, my call was changed from, Puerto Ric from Venezuela to Puerto Rico, and instead of being a mission nurse, I would be a proselyting missionary. That very evening, I was on a plane heading to Puerto Rico. I was in utter shock. Although not so much now, at the time, I was incredibly and painfully shy. This shyness was the reason I wanted to serve a welfare and humanitarian mission and not a proselyting mission. Talking to strangers absolutely scared me, where nursing was something I could do because it was helping others and serving others. For several months once I got there to Puerto Rico, I secretly thought the whole thing was a mistake and soon I'd be heading to Venezuela. It was not a mistake and I served my entire mission in Puerto Rico, proselyting. With a lot of prayer, I learned to strike up a conversation on just about anything. I also learned really to trust in the Lord. My Spanish was never as good as I thought it should have been, and I am still not probably the most outgoing person in the world, but I can honestly say that I did the best I could, and the events that transpired were the best for me to grow. The Lord knew this, even if I didn't. Now, this is many years ago, but looking back, these experiences have changed and shaped my life in so many ways. First, although my original intentions of studying nursing seemed a little ill-guided, I can see now that the Lord was directing me just for different reasons than I had thought. Nursing is part of my mission in life. Second, serving a proselyting mission really made me stretch, much more than anything else would have, and for that I am very grateful. And finally, this change in my plan has brought me experiences I would never have imagined for myself. I am a planner, and so I originally thought that I would return from my mission, return to New England, work a few years as a pediatric nurse, and get married and have a family. But the Lord had a different path for me. On my mission, I learned how much I loved going out and being with the people. Upon my return, I also found that I wasn't enjoying hospital nursing as much because I missed being out with the people in their setting and focusing on empowering them to make the changes in their own lives. An opportunity soon arose because I had learned to speak Spanish to work as a school nurse in a, in, here in Utah. 
Then other experiences occurred and other opportunities to further my education, and here I am back at BYU. I've had the opportunity to travel and learn about other countries and cultures that has greatly enriched my life. It has shown me that the world isn't as black and white as I saw it before. Although at the time it occurred, I couldn't understand why. Looking back now, I can see the Lord's hand guiding me. I am a far better person for these experiences than my plans would have ever made me. How little I knew. C.S. Lewis captures this unexpected twist in life when he said, Imagine yourself as a living house. God comes in to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps, you can understand what he is doing. He's getting the drains right and stopping the leaks in the roof and so on. You knew those jobs needed to be done, and so you're not surprised. But presently, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts abominably and does not seem to make any sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he is building quite a different house than the one you thought of, throwing out a new wing here, putting on an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were being made into a decent little cottage. He is building a palace. This reminds me of the beautiful folk tale of the three trees, which I'll briefly um, summarize for you. There are three trees on top of the mountain. The first tree wanted to become a chest to hold the greatest treasures in gold. The second tree wanted to become a ship to carry kings across the oceans. And the third tree just wanted to grow tall, to be the tallest tree in the, so that when people looked heavenward, they would think of God. One day woodcutters came and cut the three trees down. The trees were excited. Their dreams would finally come true. But the first tree was not made into a treasure chest, but a feed box for animals. The second tree became a small fishing boat, carrying stinky fish all day. The third tree was made into lumber and put into a pile. What happened, they thought. Time passed on, and the trees ne nearly forgot about their dreams. But then one night, a new star appeared in the sky, and a newborn babe was placed in the feed box, or manger. The tree suddenly realized he was holding the greatest treasure in the world. It was better than anything he could have imagined. A few years later, the second tree, which was made into a boat, had a traveler fall asleep in it, and when a storm arose on the water, the man awoke, stood, stretched his hand, and said, Peace. The storm stopped, and the second tree realized he was carrying the king of kings. And finally, one Friday morning, the third tree was taken and fashioned into a cross, where the same man was crucified. The tree felt ugly. But on Sunday, the sun arose, and the tree realized that God's love changed everything. And every time people thought of the third tree, they would think of God. And that was better than being the tallest tree. Each tree had dreams, but the Lord saw their full potential, which brought much more greater reality. In Psalms chapter 46, verse 10, the phrase, be still and know that I am God, is used again. With some help from Dr. Pike, who also grew up in New England, from the religion department, I learned that the Hebrew base, which is translated as still in this text, means stop, cease your own human striving, and watch the Lord do his work. Moses commanded the children of Israel as they fled from the Egyptians to fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. Then he parted the waters of the Red Sea. Remember that the children of Israel were frightened and complaining, and they were ready to return to Egypt. They lacked the faith that the Lord would really deliver them. Often we are too distracted by the things around us, or we do not have the faith to believe that the Lord can do anything, and so we complain and doubt. After learning the Hebrew origin of still, I went to the basic dictionary to learn the etymology of the English word still, a habit I learned from my father, an English major who loves the Oxford English Dictionary. Still actually comes from a base meaning standing or immobile. Think about this. To me, the Lord is saying, be immobile, be unwavering. Put your complete trust in the hymn and live. Someone who did this very thing was Eric Little, who won the gold medal in the 1924 Olympics in Paris. His story surrounding these events, including his refusal to run on Sunday, is portrayed in the great movie Chariots of Fire. At the end of the movie, there is a short sentence that indicates that after the Olympics, Eric went to China where he died. Well, that's true, but a huge part of the story is missing. After the Olympics, Eric did become a missionary in China. He married and had three girls, the youngest he never knew because she was born to his wife when the, and after the wife and his children had left China due to the events leading up to World War II. Eric and many others had stayed in China and ended up in a Japanese internment camp. To me, this is where Eric's life, mission, and trust in God became evident. Camp life was tough. The prisoners were not given adequate food, and other restrictions were placed upon them. It was hard, as you can imagine. However, Eric, as he had his whole life, continued to live what he preached. He had come to know God, and so where he was did not matter so much as how he acted. 
He was assigned to teach science to the children who were also in the camp. Eric had actually graduated with a degree in science from the University of Edinburgh. They didn't have the equipment to do the experiments, but he spent hours articulating and drawing them out to make sure the children understood what would and should happen. In addition, he oversaw sporting and recreational events. Children who were there in the camp remember him always patching up hockey sticks using the sheets his wife had left him for his house. In addition, he was always serving others. He helped carry coal for those who were older or disabled to ensure their stoves would continue to burn. He did not let the fact he was imprisoned, away from his family, or hungry stop him. He did die in the camp due to an inoperable brain tumor, which had caused him great headaches. So he also did all these things when not always comfortable himself. The number of lives that he touched and shaped during this time is incredible. Scores of letters and tributes have been written by those who were in the camp with him. Yet the most touching tribute is one his own daughter, who for years could not understand why her father had been separated from and away from his family, read these letters. As she heard the tributes from the children he served, she realized the Lord knew her father was needed there to help those children who had been separated from their families, and she knew exactly how that felt. At his funeral, the Reverend Arnold Bryson, a close friend of Eric, said, what was the secret of his consecrated life and far-reaching influence? Absolute surrender to God's will. His last, or Eric's last words were said to have been complete surrender, a motto he used often in his sermons. Also, at his funeral, they sang his favorite hymn. In fact, the afternoon before he died, Eric had scribbled down on a scrap piece of paper the first line of this hymn and several other parts of it. The hymn is also very fitting today. It is. It was, Be Still My Soul. Be still, my soul, the Lord is on thy side. Be still, my soul, thy best, thy heavenly friend, through thorny ways leads to a joyful end. Be still and know that I am God. As I was preparing this talk, I asked some of my nieces and nephews what they thought the scripture and doctrine and covenants meant. My eight-year-old nephew said, stop and listen, and my 11-year-old niece added, reverence. I thought they were, it was pretty insightful for children, and they really hit on a key principle one that I really struggle with. It's to be, to, in order for us to be still first, we just need to stop and then listen. About a year ago, I had new tires put on my car. I soon heard a new sound as I drove. It wasn't very loud and it wasn't consistent, so I assumed it was the road that was under construction. But the noise continued and so I brought it back to the garage. They assured me it was just fine and it was just tires. And so I was relieved and kept on my way driving, ignoring the sound. Over the time, the noise seemed to get louder and louder. I just unconsciously turned up the radio and kind of ignored it. Months later, I was in Salt Lake picking up several friends to go to a concert. The first friend got into the car. She immediately heard the noise and asked what was wrong. I replied, I don't hear anything, do you? <laughs> that tells you how bad it was. <laughs> she, of course, heard it loud and clear, as did the others. And I brought it into the garage the next day and was told the noise was due to an abnormal rubbing that had caused some major damage. It was a dangerous situation that needed immediate repair. I thought back on the miles I had driven and how I had learned to completely tune out what was a very loud noise. Now, I'm kind of embarrassed to even admit it, and I realize it's completely crazy, but I wondered what else in my life I have tuned out simply because I was too busy or distracted by other things in life, because I did not stop and listen. I do not think I'm alone with this. Life is so busy, and we are always on the go. Elder Scott reminds us, Satan has a powerful tool to use against good people. It is distraction. He would have good people fill life with good things so there is no room for the essential ones. Robert Frost had the same idea in mind when he said, the woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. Too much going on to stop. Florence Nightingale is the founder of Modern Nursing. As a teenager, she heard a voice. The story is told that she was under a tree at her home when God spoke and called her into his service. She was not quite 17 years old when the, this experience ha happened. Yet this powerful event shaped her entire life. Interestingly, when the voice of God told her she had a calling, he wasn't specific in what she was to do. This came later over time and through various other experiences in her life. However, it began quietly and calmly under a tree. He does not come in the strong winds, nor in the earthquakes, nor in the fire. He comes as a still small voice. Boyd K. Packer reminds us, the spirit does not get our attention by shouting or shaking us with a heavy hand. Rather, it whispers. 
It caresses us so gently that if we are preoccupied, we may not feel it at all. I love the reading of the Nephites in the third Nephi of the Book of Mormon as they've gathered around the temple in Bannaful after the destruction has been taken place. As they are talking amongst themselves, they hear a voice. However, the Lord had to repeat himself three times before they did hear the voice and did open their ears to hear it. The people had to be still and in tune before they understood the message. Be still and know that I am God always reminds me of the beautiful photograph taken of the Salt Lake Temple. In the picture, you see the spires of the temple as the clouds seem to be settling. To me, it's as if the clouds are the unknown tumult of the world settling, and there stands eternal truth. There stands God. He never moves, but is waiting for us to turn to him. The moment we step into the house of the Lord, the atmosphere changes from the worldly to the heavenly. It is a refuge from the ills, in life, Ills of life and a protection from the temptations. As the poem in the Washington, D.C. temple states, nor shout, nor rush, but hush, for God is here. In that same section of the Doctrine and Covenants that I used before, section 101, a few verses later, the Lord actually commands the saints to stand in holy places. Find your own holy place where you can stop being distracted by the world and things around you, and where you can stop and reflect to see the Lord's hand in your own life. I'd like to close with one of my favorite poems that likens this journey to a bike ride. At first I saw God as my observer, my judge, keeping track of the things I did wrong so as to know whether I merited heaven or hell when I die. He was out there sort of like the president. I recognized his picture when I saw it, but I didn't really know him. But later on, when I met Christ, it seemed as though life was rather like a bike ride, but it was a tandem bike, and I noticed that Christ was in the back helping me pedal. I don't know just when it was that he suggested we change places, but life has not been the same since. When I had control, I knew the way. It was rather boring, but predictable. It was the shortest distance between two points. But when he took the lead, he knew delightful long cuts, up mountains and through rocky places, and at breakneck speeds. It was all I could do just to hang on. And even though it was madness, he said, pedal. I was worried and anxious and asked, where are you taking me? He smiled and didn't answer, and I started to trust. I forgot my boring life and entered into the adventure, and when I'd say I'm scared, he'd lean back and touch my hand. He took me to people with gifts that I needed, gifts of healing, acceptance, and joy. They gave me their gifts to take on my journey, our journey, my Lord's and mine, and we were off again. He said, give the gifts away, they're extra baggage, too much weight, and so I did to the people we met. And I found that in giving, I received, and still our burdens were light. I did not trust him at first, in control of my life. I thought he'd wreck it. But he knows bike secrets, knows how to make it bend to take sharp corners, knows how to jump to clear high rocks, and knows how to fly to short and scary passages. I'm learning to be quiet and pedal in the strangest places, and I'm, enjoying, I'm beginning to enjoy the view and the cool breeze on my face with my delightful companion, Jesus Christ. And when I am sure I cannot do it anymore, he just smiles and says, pedal. As President Hinckley often reminded us, the Lord is at the helm, the church is true, and all is well. I testify that this is true as well. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that everything is in the Lord's hand. Have trust that he, it will work out because it will. Just remember to pedal when you need to pedal, take the time to stop when you need to stop and be still, and always strive to know God. I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. For more information on this Brigham Young University devotional, visit byub.org. This BYU devotional address with Aaron Mon was given on August 4, 2009. 